Hi, welcome to another episode of History in 7 Facts. In this show, we'll explore some of the most interesting things that we know or not know about our own past. In this first chapter, we've explored some of the things we know about the origins of human beings, and we've also looked into how by studying bones, we can learn a plethora of things about the past. Now that's all great, but how do we actually date those bones? Or anything else for that matter? Let's find out. In the past few centuries, we've started to get serious about studying the past. We realized that the best way to move forward is by studying the past, acknowledge it, own it, and learn from it. Dating ancient or fossilized remains wasn't easy and very often archaeologists got it wrong. But gradually scientific discoveries were made that enabled us to date ruins and organic remains with a precision that is quite astonishing if you think about it. In traditional archaeology, soil and sediments are retrieved layer by layer, thus maintaining the order in which they were deposited. By comparing artifacts from those layers with other findings from already known historical periods, you can label each layer with a pretty precise age. However, lonesome objects and remains, found nowhere near other digs, will have no context surrounding them, and thus it's very hard to make any comparisons for dating. And it's at this point that archaeologists seek help in the lab. Ceramics are among the most valued findings at an archaeological dig not just for their cultural value, but also because they can be used for dating, using thermoluminescence for instance. How? The process is very complicated to explain in this short video, but the gist of it is this. Thermoluminescence dating measures the time elapsed since the material containing crystalline minerals was either heated or exposed to sunlight. Thanks to irregularities and impurities, crystals can trap electrons that came loose due to that thermal or electromagnetic radiation. The more time passes by, the more electrons become trapped. As a crystalline material is heated during measurements at about 500 degrees Celsius, the process of thermoluminescence starts. Thanks to the heat, those electrons gain enough energy to escape. And when they do, they emit photons. The photon emission is proportional to the radiation dose absorbed by that material, meaning the older the sample, the more light is emitted. It's not a simple process, but it helps us determine when an object was last heated. It works in cases of volcanic lava, but also in prehistoric tools that were heated before they were shaped. And of course, this technique weeds out the genuine artifacts from fake ones. There's just one drawback. In order to date a sample, you need a significant amount of it, which will be destroyed during the process. Trees they're lovely to behold and are an essential part of Earth's biosphere. And they also help us date the past. You probably remember from school that when trees grow, their trunks get thicker and as they do, rings are formed. Each ring corresponds to a complete cycle of seasons, a year. Each ring bears the mark of the climatic conditions from that year. For instance, a hot, dry air means a thinner ring and vice versa. By pinpointing certain known events, we can thus analyze climatic conditions for a period of decades or even centuries year by year. This type of dating is called dendrochronology, or tree ring dating, and it can be used to date a once living material to a specific year. There are however limitations, not all trees are suitable for this technique and currently the maximum span of this type of chronology is about 11,000 years. Another dating technique used to study climate is ice core dating. This is how it works. An ice core is retrieved 
from an ice sheet or mountain glacier using drills. These cores can be drilled from up to 3.2 kilometers. Because ice forms incrementally, it's fairly logical to assume that the top layers are the youngest while the older ones are at the bottom. One method, one method of dating one method of dating these cores is by counting the visible layers by identifying where one seasonal cycle ends and the next one begins. This isn't of course always possible, so scientists also use mathematical models to predict how long it takes a snowfall to reach a particular depth. This scientific field can be used to determine how Earth's climate evolved through hundreds of thousands of years by analyzing the gases trapped in the ice, gases that are representative of the planet's atmosphere. We can also identify significant natural events like volcanic eruptions by analyzing the trapped particles from the ice. So for instance, we can correlate a specific type of ash to a specific volcano or an asteroid impact or even a wildfire and the presence of fine dust particles can hint at a particularly dry season. Identify where that grain of sand came from and you'll know where the drought occurred. Half-Life No, not the game. I'm talking about the measurement of radioactive decay. A radionuclide or radioactive isotope is an atom that has excess nuclear energy, making it unstable. This excess energy will have to be released as gamma radiation or transferred to one of its electrons or as a new particle called an alpha or beta particle. When this happens, the atom is said to undergo radioactive decay. Every single chemical element can exist as a radioactive isotope and we have ways to calculate and measure their decay rate and the half-life is the time required to reduce the radiation to half its initial value. Thus, by analyzing the state of certain radionuclides in a specific fossil or other artifact, we can determine their age. Potassium argon dating is used to date rocks because potassium is a common element present in most materials. For organic remains, the famous carbon dating method is used. This method is based on the fact that the isotope carbon-14 is constantly being created in the atmosphere by the interaction of cosmic rays with atmospheric nitrogen. The resulting radiocarbon combines with atmospheric oxygen to form radioactive carbon dioxide, which is then incorporated into plants by photosynthesis. Animals then acquire it by eating the plants, but when the animal or plant dies, it stops exchanging carbon with its environment, and from that point onwards, the amount of radiocarbon it contains begins to decrease as it undergoes radioactive decay. Measuring the amount of carbon-14 provides information that can be used to calculate when the animal or plant died. If you think that these are the only methods scientists use to try to determine the age of anything, you're wrong. There are at least 50 different methods of relative and absolute dating, each with their own advantages and limitations, and each giving us a bit more information about a certain period of time. For instance, the molecular clock technique is using the mutation rate of biological molecules to try and determine the time when two or more life forms diverged. Cementochronology is used to determine how old a person or animal was at the time of death by analyzing their teeth. Seriation is used where other methods like carbon dating cannot be applied and it uses lots of information from numerous sites in the same culture to create a chronological order. Radiometric dating works on the same principle as carbon-14 dating. Actually, carbon-14 dating is a type of radiometrics. 
The method measures the abundance of the decay products of several naturally occurring isotopes, and since we know the decay rate of every element, we can calculate the half-life of any isotope. Some isotopes have half-lives measured in millions and even billions of years, and using radiometric dating, we've determined things like the age of ancient hominids, dinosaurs, and even the age of Earth itself. I could go on like this for a while, so just remember this. No one method can be used to paint us a clear picture. Instead, information obtained using different methods is collected from different sites, compiled and used to describe in great detail what the world looked like in the past. Hold on, there's one more thing I want to talk about. Cave paintings. These early forms of art have always fascinated me and I was always wondering how do we know their age. The oldest paintings of animals that we know of were found in the Maros district of Indonesia and they are 35,000 years old, at least. Similar paintings were found in the Chauvet cave in France and Kolibuaya cave in Romania. Those are some 32,000 years old. Okay, but how do we know that? Radiocarbon dating is an incredible tool, but can it be used here too? Well, yes, but you have to be very careful. These paintings can easily be contaminated with older or newer material, since caves are known to have lots of debris, not to mention the fact that other paintings could have been added to the original ones over time. So if you want to use carbon dating, you have to use microscopic bits of the paint itself or even the torch marks on the walls. Scientists also use other relative methods, like if they find other remains in the cave, they can date those using radiocarbon. They can also use the art style to compare it to other findings, or they can use the animals that are depicted in the paintings themselves. If they represent an extinct animal, or animals typical for a savanna, you can then assign a time frame. Thank you for watching this episode of 7 Facts. I hope this was interesting and informative, and maybe it even inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked this video, please thumbs up and subscribe. While you're downstairs, let me know what you think about this video. Please consider visiting my Patreon page and become a patron. The link is in the description. I hope to see you next time. Bye.